Johnson, I'm one of the elders here. Uh, before we pray, I'd like to read Psalm 27, verses 1 through 8. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war, again, though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that, I, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above all my enemies and all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I give you I thank you for this glorious day that you've given us. I thank you for the ability to be here to openly worship you. I thank you that you are a personal God, that you want that relationship with us, that you make yourself available so that we can seek after you. Lord, I thank you that you gave us your son so that we have everlasting life. Lord, this morning I pray for Pastor John as he gives the message that he speaks your words, that you use him, that people this morning that are here that do not know you as their Lord, that you draw them to you, that they, their eyes, their hearts are open to you, Lord, I also pray for the community and the churches in this community and the people that they are, they are also drawn to you. Lord, I say these things in your holy name. Amen. All right, if you would please stand as we sing our first song. Go ahead and clap along with us.
Deuteronomy 32.4 says, He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How upright he is. So let's continue to sing, sing, sing praises to our faithful and amazing Lord.
Great to make go with Miss Paula. Well, friends, we are great to have you. Glad to have you here today. Always uh, appreciate worshiping. Appreciate our worship team leading us in uh, part of our worship. Right is is songs and uh, and uh, singing out to Him, and then part of our worship is is prayer and reading his word and unpacking his word, and that's the part we're going to be transitioning to here as well. But in case we haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is John Harms, I'm the pastor here, and uh, again, we're just so grateful to have you worshiping with us this morning. We're going to be starting a new series today. We're going to be here for next 12, 13 weeks or so. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. About a third of the way uh, through the Old Testament before the before Psalms. So if you kind of just open up your Bible, it'll generally about halfway like the Psalms is right there. 
So before the book of Psalms, there's like Esther, and then there's Nehemiah is right there as well. And we'll be learning more about him here in just a second. And uh, we're, the different themes that we're going to be encountering, we're going to be talking about those here in just a second too. But before we dive in to Nehemiah, I want to turn your attention to a psalm. And that psalm is Psalm number 82. It's chapter 82. I'm only going to read uh, a few verses here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just read Psalms eight, Psalm 82, verses 1 through 4, and then I'm going to just kind of pray a prayer from those psalms. Now, this is an interesting psalm. This is uh, one that uh, you can dig a lot into and kind of encounter some things, but essentially, uh, I'm going to... Uh, what has happened here is God has established rulers and principalities. Uh, we would know them as quote unquote angels, but they're angelic beings known as the Elohim. He's established them to have dominion over different regions of the earth. They're kind of his underlings, his governors over the earth. And God is passing judgment upon them here in Psalm 82 for allowing injustice under their domain. You know, we've seen how different chiefs of police, for example, get fired because there's chaos or mayors or presidents or kings get overthrown because there was chaos in their dominions. Well, God is passing judgment upon the Elohim, these leaders, spiritual rulers that were under his authority. He's going to refer to them as God's lowercase g here in this case. But he's going to be passing judgment against them because of injustice in the world. And friends, we do not have to look far in order to see the injustice in our world today. And so I want to begin by praying over injustice for God's justice to be done, especially as we reflect upon Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly there in Hugoton who were murdered tragically uh, a few weeks ago. So let us begin by reading Psalm 82, verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to be praying this uh, part of this psalm as well. It says this, God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the needy, save them from the power of the wicked. Let's pray. God, we first off want to begin by praising you, that you alone stand in authority over all things, over all the princes of the air, the principalities of the earth. You alone are supreme, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God who stands above all other gods. But Lord, we recognize that there is injustice in our lives and there is injustice in the world because of sin. Sin, God, that we are often guilty of. Lord, it can be foolish of us, although we lean towards this too often, to point our fingers at others and point out the wrongs in their life when we ourselves are guilty of sin beyond counting. And so, Father, as we recognize the sin in others, may we recognize the sin in ourselves and repent of that. But, Lord, we long for that day where you bring healing and restoration, not only to our own lives, but to a fallen and to a broken world. We pray for those who are hurt by sin and injustice. We call upon your justice for the needy and the fatherless Father, in the case of the families of those two ladies, Veronica and Jillian, we pray for those families who are now motherless. Our hearts hurt, and we are repulsed by wickedness. Lord, we know that you are repulsed by wickedness as well, and you are weeping and you are grieved over this injustice. Father, we pray that you will rescue families Lord, that you will rescue families from sin and the brokenness that they are in. Lord, we pray for those two families in particular that your spirit of comfort and peace will be upon them in a very mighty way. But Lord, for those who are experiencing brokenness 
here this morning. May your peace, may your presence be upon them as well. And fathers, we prepare to open your word and to learn about the life and the ministry of Nehemiah as he was dealing with injustice and brokenness in his time. God, help us to be bold as Nehemiah will exhibit for us against sin, but Lord, help us to be full of compassion and grace as well. So Father, again, as we prepare to study your word, transform our lives. Where there is brokenness, bring healing through your Savior. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. The title today, as we're in Nehemiah chapter 1, guess what, we're, in Nehemiah, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2 next week, and then Nehemiah chapter 3 after that. So you can know, you can read ahead where we're going to be going here. <clears throat> but uh, the title today is this, Big Problem, Big Prayer. Big Problem, Big Prayer. Let me ask you this question. When you, well, let me, let me ask you this. This is not rhetorical. Go ahead and raise your hand for me if you can relate to this. Do any of you have a problem or problems in your life? Go ahead and, and raise your hand. Okay. And those of you with your hand down, would you just go ahead and say, I'm a liar? All right. Just go ahead and, all right. Here's the deal. We all have problems or, prob, or a big problem in our life. Period. It happens. It's a reality. Brokenness is the reality that we experience because we live in a broken world. That's why our mission here at First Southern Baptist Church is we acknowledge that we're just broken people connecting broken people with the healing Savior. That's what we're here for. We're not claiming to be better than anyone else, but by the grace of God. Now, it can be easy for us to go and say, well, yes, I have some problems, but I'm great. I don't have that problem. And that is true. But I'm not here negating any of the problems or that problem in your life that you're going through. Your financial struggles, your uh, relational struggles, your addiction issues, that rebellious child. Again, we all have different troubles in our life, that diagnoses that we're afraid that is coming or whatever might be the case or has come we all have troubles in our life and so let me ask you this where do you turn to when you encounter these troubles how do you handle them do you call up a friend for counsel godly advice I pray or do you call up a friend to gripe and complain do you yell at your spouse do you because you're agitated at work, do you take it out on your family at home? Or because you're agitated at your family, do you take it out on your coworkers at work? Uh, you know, you, you know the pattern. How about this? Do you, do you turn to your family? Do you turn to your church family? Or do you just kind of check out? Maybe some of you turn to your addiction that you, that you deal with in order to numb the pain. You're not handling the, pro the problem. You're not dealing with the problem. You're just trying to numb it, right? So we, we scroll on social media. We, uh, we just kind of get sucked into little videos of monkeys. I don't know, whatever you're, you're in to whatever's popular on you know, social media today and all that's different, right? But it, do we kind of just check out of our mess and, and just kind of binge watch, th watch things to kind of or engage that way to numb the pain? Well, Nehemiah is going to encounter a big problem. And we're going to see what that problem is in a second. We're going to see what he does in response to that. And I would dare say that it is, there is wisdom here, spiritually speaking for certain, for all of us to follow his example. See, Nehemiah is going to encounter a big problem, and he's going to, as a result, he's going to pray a big prayer. And so for many of us, again, there's some lessons here, because rather than check out, rather than numb ourselves, maybe we, we go in a corner and we just shut down and cry or whatever, maybe God is saying, hey, you know what, instead of trying to just ignore this issue, maybe you ought to bring it to me in prayer. 
the God who spoke all space, time, and everything into existence, I would dare say there is no problem too big that he cannot handle. Two weeks ago, we celebrated him overcoming death. He was dead in a tomb three days, three nights, and he walked out of that. I'm pretty sure your problem is less than being dead, okay? And I'm pretty sure, I'm positive, therefore I'm 100% positive that our God is sufficient to help you with these issues. So today we're talking about big problem, big prayer. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. Before we turn there though, I want to give you a little bit of a background because this is, if you're not familiar with kind of what's happened, this might come as a little bit of a like uh, not understanding. All right, so roughly 90 to 100 years before Nehemiah's time, there was a great rebellion in Israel. The people had turned away from God. God way earlier, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, said, listen, if you follow me, you're going to be blessed. If you don't follow me, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be shackled as slaves and you're going to be dispersed among the people's and that's called the exile, and that's exactly what happened. The Babylonian uh, Empire came in, and because of Israel's rebellion against God, they were worshiping other gods, because of his re- their rebellion against God, God came in and he was faithful to his word, and he punished them, and he brought uh, justice upon them for their rebellion and sin, and they were dispersed. And so now for roughly about 90 years at this time, They've been away all over, all over the territory, like modern day Middle East and that sort of thing. They've been spread out hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of miles away from each other so that they couldn't rally and unite. Well, so then fast forward about uh, 30, 40 years into that, 50 years into that, uh, this prophet, we know him as uh, Jeremiah and Zerubbabel, I'm pretty sure I've got that right, they go and they gather together some people and they come uh, back to uh, gather them together. And then they start rebuilding the, the temple, but then they stop. And we're going to, again, kind of learn a little bit more about this in a second. And then fast forward about 30, 50 years, something like that. And then uh, another guy by the name of Ezra, he's a priest, he comes, resumes the temple. They get the temple built, but the walls are still destroyed. And it's hard for us to relate what, why walls are important, but walls to them were like roads and electricity are to us. They were essential. They were important. No one would invest in a community, financially or otherwise, if they didn't have walls to protect them and gates that were secure. Just like nobody's going to invest in a community and bring a multi-million dollar industry into a community that doesn't even have electricity or no way of getting electricity, so it was in the days of Jerusalem when uh, Nehemiah receives this news. And so this is where we're going to be kind of picking up the story. Nehemiah is going to receive some news. It's going to break his heart. It's a big problem. And so he's going to pray a big prayer. All right, so Nehemiah chapter 1. If you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be reading the entire chapter. Thankfully, all these chapters are really not that long. There's, there's 11 verses in Nehemiah chapter 1, okay? So Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to begin. And we'll learn a little bit more backstory as we, as we proceed in the message here. But I wanted to kind of let you know what was happening right now. <clears throat> all right, so Nehemiah uh, chapter 1. And immediately I recognized that I forgot to look up how to pronounce Hakaliah, so we're just going to own it and go with it. All right, here we go. Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Yeah, prove me wrong if I'm wrong. All right. During the month of Shizlev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. Remember, we talked about what that exile was. And they said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down, and its gates have been burned. When I heard these words, 
I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heavens. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept your commands, status, statutes, excuse me, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your, your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them there from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant so, uh, and, and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At that time, I was the king's cupbearer. You may be seated. <clears throat> Leading up to Easter, we had um, our 40 days of focus and where we learned about a different name or attribute of God. And again, I want to say thank you to all of you who participated in the videos and who followed along with your notebooks and your, and your workbooks. But it was becoming evident, like, hey, where do I go from here? Like, after Easter, I, I knew David, Pastor Dave, was going to be preaching last week. Uh, and, and I'm like, but where do we go from here? And so I started just kind of praying. And in my own quiet time, I, I read through uh, a book of the Old Testament, not every day, okay? I read like a chapter or two of the Old Testament. I'll read a psalm or a proverb, and then I'll read a, a chapter or two of the New Testament. So, like, I'm in... Um, Job right now, I'm in Second John as, as well. So, but at this time, I was reading through Nehemiah. Several months ago, I was reading through Nehemiah. And just I was just kind of jotting notes down. I like to write, actually, in my Bible. I've got wide margins in it. So I was kind of writing down things, and it was just kind of speaking to me. And I just realized, like, this is a book that if you haven't studied before, there is a tremendous amount of value in. So many people are afraid to study the Old Testament, and I'm intentionally staying in the Old Testament here for a while because I want, us, I want you to know there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Are there some things that we don't understand at times? Yes. But the point is, uh, here in Nehemiah, it, I mean, in the Old Testament, it's worth our time and our attention. And you have opportunities then to ask questions of the elders or myself if you encounter some situations or circumstances that, that don't quite make sense, especially in the Bible. But here at Nehemiah, as I was studying it, you see here he's got a tremendous amount of wisdom, of vision. In fact, Andy Stanley wrote a, a really good book called Visioneering, and it's based upon Nehemiah. I would actually recommend that book to you. Uh, he's got leadership. He's got a heart for the Lord and for the righteousness of God, and he's got a heart for his people. Ultimately, we're going to see that Nehemiah is praying and seeking out not just uh, uh, financial, political renewal, but spiritual renewal in the hearts of the Israelite people. We would know that term today. We would call it revival. That's what Nehemiah is seeking here in the book of Nehemiah. He's praying for, ne Nehemiah. He's praying for revival. As uh, Tony Evans puts it, the book of Nehemiah is about making wrong things right. That's what the book of Nehemiah is about. And we're going to see here how God is going to do some amazing things in the Jewish people. And it begins with one man. A friend, as I was preparing, he asked me this question because we were talking about big problems, big prayer. He said, what is the most dangerous prayer that a person can pray? 
And the most dangerous prayer that a person can pray is this, God use me. Because He will. And that's exactly what Nehemiah recognizes in his life. You see, whenever God wants to get a work done, He lays hold of willing people. See, the walls of Jerusalem had been ruined. We're going to learn, recap a little history here. A small remnant had returned, and there was much work that needed to be done. And so in the year 536 B.C., Zerubbabel and Joshua had taken about 50,000 Jews back, and by the year 516, they'd begun rebuilding the temple, but it had stalled. And then in the year 457, again, we're B.C., so our numbers get smaller as we get closer to zero here, where our new year begins, uh, uh, our new uh, time frame kind of begins. But in the year 457, a small revival under the priest named Ezra, again, another good book to read in the Old Testament, he began finishing the work of the temple, and it was accomplished. But now fast forward about 50 years, roughly 90 years since Zerubbabel and Joshua had taken people back to Jerusalem, and 15 years since the temple had been done, we discover that the walls are still in shambles. And so God was looking for someone to go to this ruined city and to restore safety and security, and Nehemiah was that man. He was a cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah, even though he was a Jew, and Jews were traditionally shunned uh, from those kind of positions, his wisdom obviously won over King Artaxerxes, and he had a high position in the court. See, a cupbearer was somebody who was like the uh, uh, chief of staff. He kind of arranged things, made things things happen for the king. He was always at the king's side. He was literally eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine. One, to see if it was poison. So standard protocol would be Nehemiah would walk over to the king if they were bringing him some drink and he would sip the cup and then lay it to the king. I don't know if they counted to 30 or something to see if Nehemiah then died um, or, or what, but then after that, then the king felt knew that the food and the wine was safe to drink. Same with the food. He'd like nibble off a, a piece of chicken leg, I don't know, and then like, here, you can have the other half. I, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how this worked, but he was, the Nehemiah as a cupbearer was a protector of the king, and he was also because he was always in close proximity. You never knew when the king would get hungry, right? So Nehemiah was always right there. He would kind of take down no to make sure that the king's like, hey, I want this, this, this. And got it, got it. And, and so he had a tremendous responsibility for helping to run uh, the, the kind of Persian empire that King Artaxerxes was in charge of. So he held a very high position in the court. He was close to the king and could share in the king's confidence. But Nehemiah was not forgetful about his people And so when his brother came with some other Jews, he eagerly asked them for news about Jerusalem and how things were going today. And the news he received was distressing. The remnant was suffering shame. Their walls were broken down and the gates were burned. Instead of being a city of praise and glory, it was a city of shame and reproach. So based upon God's word, Nehemiah began what we would call today a community development program among God's people. With the blessing and the help of a pagan king, Nehemiah would return and rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. I'll give you a little hint here. They rebuild the walls. By chapter 6, the walls are built. What had been destroyed for 115 years, Nehemiah and some faithful men by the grace of God and women too rebuild the wall in only 52 days. It's going to be an incredible feat of vision, leadership, and God's protection and blessing upon people who are striving to be obedient to Him. But before he can begin this community development process and spiritual renewal, Nehemiah prays. He was facing a daunting task. He was facing a big problem. 
He had heard the struggles of his people in Jerusalem. So what did he do? He jumped into action and started gathering the troops? No. He paused and he prayed. And then he did something else that us Baptists are sometimes don't like to read about. He fasted. I'm assuming since he was the cupbearer, he couldn't fast 100% from food, but I'm sure he would take a little nibble, take a little sip, and then give it to the king and eat nothing more. He ate as absolute bare minimum as he can for extended periods of time so that he could focus. The more his stomach would start to rumble and grumble, he would then use that to focus upon God and use that as a time of prayer. That's what fasting does. Because he wanted to draw himself closer to God. And friends, the closer you are to God, the more in tune with His will, His ways, and ultimately His power and authority that we are. And so here's the faith principle that we're going to be unpacking here for the rest of our time together. The answer, the faith principle is really in our title today, but here it is. When we encounter big problems, they require big prayers. Friends, big problems require big prayers. Any problems require prayers, by the way, but let's, let's, let's just keep this to the big theme here at hand, hand. There was some big trouble going on, and so he was going to pray and fast for an extended period of time because he recognized he could not do this on his own. And so let's see this model, this template then, that Nehemiah kind of followed. And it's a template that if you've gone through the, our, our small group Rooted, you've learned about this template when it comes to prayer. And if you haven't gone through Rooted, one, we're going to be uh, probably in the next few weeks uh, rebooting one for the summer and then certainly in the fall. I would encourage you to go through our small group called Rooted. But anyway, we're going to be learning about this template for prayer that Nehemiah exhibited for us and that we can emulate as well. We can follow as well. Because time and time again, I've had people ask me this. How do I pray? What does a pattern of prayer look like in our lives? And so Nehemiah unpacks this for us. The first, when it comes to pray, we're going to use the acronym PRAY, by the way. P-R-A-Y. The first one is praise. Look what Nehemiah does in verse 5. He's got this big problem and so he prays this big prayer. And how does he begin that big prayer? With praise. Verse 5 says this, I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. He's praising God. Friends, all prayer needs to start with the praise of who God is. It needs to start with an act of worship because worship is essential. It helps to put things in perspective in our lives. It, help, it also helps us when we start with praise to kind of ne- uh, ward off that negativity that all of us can be so guilty of falling into. So many times we're like, I'm going to pray and God, you need to hear this. I got this, this, this. And whoa, whoa, whoa. You can get there in a minute. But first off, you need to recognize who is God compared to you? How does Nehemiah start it? He said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God. He was the second in command, like he was, to King Artaxerxes. He was like his right-hand man to one of the most powerful rulers in the world at that time. And he's like, this guy's nothing. He doesn't even refer to him as a king. He calls him at the end of his prayer, this man. This ought to put things in perspective to how big God is. And he was praying and praising a big God. One commentator put it like this, every time we talk to God, we should easily be able to find something to thank him for. So how do you start off your day? Oh, God, I'm so sore. Or do you roll out of bed and say, God, thank you for another day where I have an opportunity to worship you and to help others get to know you as well. 
God, thank you for the breath in my lungs. What are you thankful for God in in your own life? For Nehemiah, he, was, he received some terrible news. And yet he starts off by thanking God that he was a God who keeps his gracious covenants. And we're going to get to that in a moment. Second, when it comes to our, how to, what's our pattern for prayer that Nehemiah gives us, is repent. He starts off with praise, and then he transitions into repentance. Verses 6 and 7, we see Nehemiah say this, Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to your servant's prayer, that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands and statutes and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Let's pause for a second and think about this. Why were they in exile? Were they in exile because of Nehemiah's sin? Nehemiah wasn't even born when God was passing judgment upon his people some 90 years prior to this. And yet Nehemiah recognizes that he is still a man who, has, who sins and needs forgiveness of his sins. And he has to own accountability for his sins. So he says what? Both I and my father's family. He's not, he's not taking it all on, but he's not, he's not shirking it either. He's saying, hey, we're all in this mess because of sin. Nehemiah had received a crushing blow. His heart was hurting for those in Jerusalem for, and for his people. He needed, he wanted God's help, but he needed God to intervene and he realized he needed to pray a prayer of repentance and lament. He didn't shirk any of those responsibilities when it came to repentance. Even though he wasn't in Jerusalem, he wasn't directly responsible for that exile, he still confessed sin. He recognized that as a leader, and as all of us do who are in leadership positions in particular, especially for husbands or wives or moms or dads, we see sin happening in our family's lives and it breaks our heart, but we have to repent of our own sins as well before we can be confessing the sins of our kids, for example. So here, he was confessing his sin. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 puts it like this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. First John tells us that if any of you think you are without sin, you're a liar and the Spirit of God is not in you. Friends, the more we draw closer to God and His holiness, the more we recognize how wicked we are. Period. How, how much holier God is how much sinful, more sinful we become compared to the holiness of God. The people of Israel had been worshiping other gods. They had abandoned the way and the instruction of the Lord and were now dealing with the consequences of their sin. Friends, where there is sin in our lives, we need to confess that sin. We need to repent of that sin so that God can bring healing into our brokenness. So he began this prayer with praise to God, repentance of his own sin, repentance of the sin of his people, and he re because he recognized that big problems require big prayers, and repentance was a part of that. And then, after he had praised God, after he would repented of his sin, he transitioned into the part that we all like to typically jump to on the front end, and that's the ask, right? Like, well, God, let me, let me tell you why I'm here this morning. I'm broke, and uh, you need to help me out here. And that might be true, and that very well, he definitely needs to intervene. But remember, there's a time and a place for seeking the Lord and how we do that. It begins with prayer and praise, pardon me, and it transitions then into repentance, confession of our own sin. And then the ask came. We see what that looks like here in verses, uh, let's see, 8 through 11 says this, here's the ask, please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are faithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Or if you are unfaithful, pardon me, 
I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, and even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Here's the ask. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. We're going to read about in chapter 2 next week what's about to happen. He's going to ask for permission to leave the king and go to this foreign land to begin rebuilding the wall. That's the ask that's about to happen. And we're going to see another prayer <laughs> happen in, in chapter 2 as well. But Nehemiah here is giving us a pattern for how we need to be praying in our own, la- in our own lives as well. Praise, repent, and ask. Notice here in verse 9 that what, a- God, that what Nehemiah pardon me, is asking for is what God has already promised. Like, wait a minute, what? Remember, he's reminding God, like God really means reminding, but he's just repeating back to God his promises. He said in verse 9, if you return to me, he's repeating God's words to Moses, and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, which is what, exactly what happened, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. He was praying in alignment with God's word. Do you recognize that? He was praying in alignment for God's word. And let me tell you, God is going to answer this request. God is going to answer this request. Another commentator put it like this. God encourages us to ask for things that are on our mind. But if you want a guaranteed success, yes, by our human standards, if you want that successful guaranteed prayer, then you need to pray what God has already told us to pray. God, help me to make disciples. God, give me boldness to share the gospel. God's already told us he wants to empower us with those things. He's going to give us success. He's going to give us a yes when we pray for God, things that God has already instructed us to pray for. But what about those things that aren't quite as clear? What about we are that relational issue, that struggle? What about that money finance issue that we're having? What about this unknown, should I take this job, not take that job? What about those kind of things? Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Jesus answers that here in his famous Sermon on the Mount. He says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the the one who finds, and the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give give good things to those who ask him. Friends, I want to remind you, I want to implore you here, do not be afraid to ask God. Okay, Don't be afraid to ask him. He loves you. He cares about you. When we have asked Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior, we have then become a child of God. And it says here, he is a good father. Do not be afraid to ask things for God. But just, I want to remind you now, sometimes the answer is no. When my kids were younger, and it was late at night, 9 o'clock at night, and they would ask for a Dr. Pepper. The answer was no. Why? Because I knew they needed rest, not sugary caffeine. And I, I needed rest too. And, but I, I, we would say no sometimes, man and I would, because we knew what was best for our kids. And I'm here to tell you, there's going to come a day where you don't, maybe you don't understand why God is not giving you an answer right now to a prayer. 
I've got an idea for, and I'll talk about it in a second, but maybe you don't know why the answer was no to a prayer. Let me tell you this, someday when we stand before the Lord and He begins to unpack more of His wisdom to us, we're going to recognize that when we know all the things that God knows, which we never will, but in heaven we'll understand more of what happened here on earth, we're going to understand why He did what He did or didn't do what He didn't do. And we're going to recognize that all that He says yes to or no to will be in line with His will and will bring maximum glory to God. And so are there some guaranteed yeses that God hears our prayers on? Yes, absolutely. The Bible tells us that when we pray a prayer of repentance, God hears it every time. But there are going to be some things, and I'll just use a silly example, God give me a million dollars in my bank account, where sometimes He might just say no, or not yet, to these things, because He knows what's best for us and because he is a good father and he knows how to give good things to those who ask him and sometimes we don't always ask for the what's the best thing we ask for the most comfortable thing or the most convenient thing in our life all right so we need to ask God but we can ask more confidently when we have praised him when we have confessed sin when we've aligned our spirit with his and then the ask comes Friends, big problems require big prayers. We need to praise Him. We need to repent. We need to ask. And then the final why on pray is then we need to yield to Him. To yield means to be quiet after you have spoken to God and to listen for what He might want to say to you. If you know me, this is the hardest part of my prayer life right here. Be quiet. I like to talk. And yet, God's word says this, to be still and to know that I am God. And so when you've set aside that 10, 20, 5 minutes, I don't know, however long you're bringing your big problem to God and you praised Him, you've confessed sin, you're writing down, you're talking about all the sins that you know of that are coming to mind, whatever, and then you've asked Him for that prayer, and then the next step is to shut up. To be still and to yield to God and let Him answer you back. I like to use a journal to write down some of my prayers. It allows me to kind of focus a little bit more. It also allows me to look back and to see where God has answered prayers, yes or no, because no is also an answer sometimes. But either way, we need to make sure that we're listening to God, that we trust Him even if the, we trust him that even if the answer is no, we know it is for our best. But the yielding and the waiting as I, in my own life, I suspect for many of us, is often the hardest thing. Now, let me be clear. Yielding does not mean we do nothing. In fact, let's see what Nehemiah was doing as he was yielding to God. We're going to be back to chapter 4, or verse 4 rather we're going to see that Nehemiah was yielding with persistence. He was praying with persistence. Some of us have a tendency to like come down, tell God our issue, you know, praise. Okay, I'm going to do what Pastor John said. I'm going to to praise God. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask. All right, God, where's your answer? Do you realize that this praying and fasting that Nehemiah was engaged in was four months long? He was praying and fasting for a four-month time frame. He had a big problem. He needed a big God to answer. But he knew it wasn't going to just happen overnight. And so he was, he was praying and fasting for four months. Chapter 2, the, ver- the opportunity is going to come and he's going to step into it. But he was praying and fasting for four months. Some of you have a big problem in your life. And you need to continue to pray and fast over that issue. This is not a a, a one-time thing. I I had a spiritual conversation this week about demonic possession. Yes, it is real. It is still happening today. And we know from Scripture that there is a hierarchy 
in the spiritual realm. Some have more authority and power than others. We see this play out in, in the Gospels where the, the uh, disciples are not able to cast out a particular demon. There are several reasons to it, but Jesus comes along, casts it out, the demon flees, and the disciples go, what was that about? Why couldn't we do it? And he's like, this was a deaf and mute demon. It requires prayer and fasting. It required an extended time of spiritual warfare, unless you're God and you can just get it done quick, which we're not. It required a, a, an extended time in order to fight that spiritual battle. Some of you are in an extended spiritual battle in your life, in your time, in your heart right now. And you need to give dedicated and persistent prayers to God. When he heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, four months, fasting and prayer before the God of heaven. He prayed and fasted for an extended period of time. He was praying and fasting for the rebuilding of a wall that they would find blessing and resources in order to do that. He was praying and fasting for the rebuilding of a society back in Jerusalem. He was praying and fasting for revival to take place in God's people. And we're going to see next week how God responds to this extended prayer time of his servant, Nehemiah. But I just want to remind you that when he steps out, he steps out in faithfulness, in anticipation of what God can do and is able to do, Nehemiah does. And I want to remind you in Scripture that whatever you're facing, God is bigger than that. He's bigger than your problems. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 reminds us of that. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Friends, big problem requires big prayers. So what big problems are you facing in your life today that you need to give to the Lord in prayer? Your finances, a job situation, a relationship issue, maybe a health diagnosis or scare. Maybe you have a family member or a loved one who's in rebellion. Is there forgiveness in your life that that root of bitterness has taken hold and you've got to give it up to God. Is there addictions? Are there drugs, alcohol, pornography, gambling? What sin is there that you need to give to God? Friends, I want to remind you what Nehemiah reminds us of. Please remember that you commanded what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. I love this line. It's an awesome line. Please remember what you commanded your so servant Moses. Now we know, friends, that God does not forget. So Nehemiah was saying in effect here, Lord, remember your word about your cursing. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you. But also remember your word about your blessing. That if you return to me, I will gather you. Friends, no matter what mess you have created, no matter how far you have gone, God has good news for you. He's in the gathering business. In other words, if you are faithful, He will turn things around. He will turn circumstances around. No matter how bad things get, God will honor His Word. But our big problems require Big prayers. Are you willing to praise, repent, ask, and yield to God today with the issues that are in your life? Let's pray.
God, thank you that you are in the gathering business. That someday you're going to gather every tribe, nation, and tongue together to worship you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you that we live in a city where that a glimpse of heaven can be happen, happening here on earth in Garden City. And Father, I thank you that you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness and that you are God of your word. That when we call out to you with a broken and contrite heart, you respond and you obey. God, thank you. I give you praise for that. But Lord, I know there is sin in my own life. Pride in my own life. Control in my own life that I try and cling to. God, there is sin, pride, and control in the lives of these people here as well that they try and cling to. So God, help us to repent. Help us to trust you more in such a way that we can cast all of our cares upon you and our sins upon you and you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now God, I pray for these people. I pray for me too. That where there are big problems in our lives, when we pray big prayers with persistence and faithfulness in in particular, that God, you are faithful and you hear and you respond, and you move, and where there's brokenness, you bring restoration. Where there's hurting, you bring healing. And so God, I pray for these people here today. And now we wait. We yield to you. Father, give us a fresh word. Give us renewed heart. And help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. I've already asked some people to be our prayer intercessors. And here's what I'm at. And they're going to come forward at this time. This is their their cue to come forward. And here's what I'm saying to you today. Friends, I believe there's some big problems in your life that you need to confess and give to God. And these people are here to pray with and for you. So I want to encourage you today, don't stay where you are. You've got a big problem, you need a big prayer. Come forward, bring it to God, and we're gonna, one of these men or women are going to come alongside and pray and encourage you. If you need an extended conversation, that's okay. We'll go to one of these side rooms and we'll have that conversation. But I just want to encourage you during this invitation song to do not stay where you are at. Where God is leading a prayer, bringing a burden upon your heart, come forward and let one of these men and women pray with and for you today. So let's stand. And again, now it's your opportunity to respond. You've got a big problem, come pray a big prayer to God.
just uh, continue our time in prayer here in just a second or right now and then we'll do the offering but let's, let's just continue to pray God we are grateful for your mercies in our lives Lord we are grateful for your spirit stirring and directing in ways that maybe catch us off guard that surprise us and God it's good for us to be surprised by you though for us to recognize that we're not in control we don't get to do whatever we want to do. God, when we're your child, we're your slaves as well. We, we do your will. We behave in ways that bring you glory and honor. And so that is my prayer this morning that we continue to submit fully in all aspects to you. Lord, where there is sin, Lord, we know there is grace that is greater. And we welcome that grace in our lives and in our church so father may this just be the beginning of you stirring in our hearts may this be the beginning of more complete and full obedience to you for your glory and for our good we ask these things amen well there's we're going to have somebody come pray over the offering here in just a second looks like gabe's the man for that but there's a connect card in the chair back around you. So if God's got you a prayer request on your heart, or maybe you want to talk about baptism, or so, you may be seated. <laughs> Sorry, you may be seated. Uh, maybe there's just something on your heart that you want to talk about. Please use that connect card and uh, put it in the offering plate when that comes around, or you can turn it in at the next step station. So Gabe, why don't you come pray over the offering? God is good, amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here today, Lord. We lift up the hearts that were touched this morning. And Father, we know as believers that, that you are with us always, and it's us that turns away from you. Father, I pray that as we go forth today that we keep our heart of worship throughout this week and be a witness to those around us. Father, as we know that everything we have is, is from you. It, you own it, Lord. And Father, as we come to this time where um, we show our obedience and give back some of that to you, Lord, I pray that we do so with joyful hearts. Father, we love you. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Olá, boa tarde. Meu nome é Ismaeli Domingos. Eu sou diretora do BR442. Vamos conhecer um pouquinho da rotina do nosso projeto.
Nós temos várias atividades com os meninos aqui no projeto. E uma dessas atividades é atividades físicas, né? Onde nós estimulamos, estimulamos a brincadeira. Através da brincadeira nós conhecemos e nós aprendemos também através da brincadeira. Nós somos gratos a Deus né, e gratos à Compaixion do Brasil por poder proporcionar tudo o que nos proporciona aqui no projeto. Nós temos aula de música, nós temos também arte, nós temos educação cristã né, e também temos atendimento médico. Muitas vezes esses meninos não conseguem nenhum lugar para poder ser atendido no médico e aqui no projeto eles podem ter essa oportunidade. Além da alimentação, né, que nós procuramos fazer uma alimentação saudável, uma alimentação onde proporcionamos nutrientes necessários para eles e eles precisam desse nutriente e eles gostam muito. Né? Além também temos o lazer, temos vários passeios, podemos é, conhecermos vários lugares através do projeto. Então tudo isso é proporcionado pela Compeixa. E também temos no projeto várias, uma dinâmica bem diferente. Onde temos o Masterchef, temos também acampamentos, onde passamos três dias, retiros espirituais, passamos três dias com os meninos, podendo falar do amor de Deus. E nós agradecemos a Deus porque, e a Compeixo, porque faz com que nós possamos libertar realmente as crianças da pobreza, não só de uma pobreza física, mas principalmente da pobreza espiritual, em nome de Jesus. As most of you probably already saw on your bulletin, today is Compassion Sunday. And I am very happy to be here. I feel blessed to be able to talk a little bit about this video because this video was made by the girl, but the director of the project where Louie and I sponsor our child. And uh, we've had the privilege to meet Ismaeli before and she's uh, the director, she's a so she has a social uh, work a degree, and she came from the Compassion, the same project that she now is a director of. So she came from a slum that, that where our girl lives, the same, the same location, and here she is today serving uh, in, a, in a mighty, mighty way. Uh, it's interesting because today um, in our Sunday school, we, I hadn't, really planned on uh, reading this verse, but I think it's very appropriate. Jesus reading this passage out of Isaiah and talking about the fact that he was fulfilling that prophecy that says, the spirit, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's out of the chapter four of the book of Luke. But you know, this is what uh, compassion is all about, is about releasing children from poverty in the name of Jesus. Like Ismaeli mentioned, it's not just about the physical po poverty, but also the spiritual poverty. So as they, they teach them about Jesus, they also provide things like you guys saw, you know, uh, currently $42 a month, you can, you know, have such an impact and completely change the trajectory of somebody's life. And it's usually not just their life, it's the life of their family. Like Ismaeli today, you know, she, um, along with her husband and two kids, she's been able to help her parents as well. So it is a fantastic, fantastic ministry. Um, we have cards out there on the table, and I really encourage you, even if you do not know for sure if you want to do this or if the Lord is dealing, leading with you, uh, dealing with you uh, or leading you in that direction, I would encourage you to at least pick up a card today, take it home, pray over it throughout the week, because this would be a fantastic way uh, to do it with your kids, to do it with your grandkids, and you don't know. You know, we've had Carla Gabriela, we've sponsored her now for it since she was four. She's 11 now. She just turned 11 last month. And through my, you know, the app, the, app, the Compassion app, I write letters to her, you know, tag some pictures, and then we get letters back from her as well. We get the in the mail, but we also get through the app. So it's a it's a great ministry. It can total, totally change somebody's life. And in the process, like she says, they are taught about Jesus. They are taught about uh, the love of Jesus for them, but in a very tangible way, because it completely uh, provides them with opportunities uh, to go to college, you know, like uh, Ismaeli. You know, in the, the year that Louie and I got to go and visit uh, the project, they had 10 kids graduating from college that had come out of that project. And probably the chances that would, that, that would have happened to them, pretty slim if they had had that opportunity. So just, I encourage you, like I said, we'll be out there, Dean and I will be at the table. And if you wanna come and pick up a card, take it home, pray about it, see what, how the Lord leads you. And um, I sure hope that some will be picked up by next week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dina. I am Tessie, your ministry assistant. I'll keep this as brief as I can. Tonight is the night, 6 o'clock. The Bowler Jacks are here for another concert. If you would like to help set up with that, Alondra would appreciate your help. You could be here at 3.30. And that uh, is a free admission. You come as you are, and they'll receive a love offering. Hey, the ladies are going to get together again for a fellowship. We're going to do a game night. That'll be the 16th. 6.30 to 8.30 in the community room. That's this classroom right over here. Bring a snack to share. And then one thing that didn't make it in your bulletin is our quarterly business meeting is next Sunday at 5 o'clock, and we hope you will be there. There's a lot more announcements in your bulletin, so please grab one or scan that QR code on the back of your chair and get all those announcements. All right. One more thing. Okay, so hey, Pastor Tim, our, our church uh, that we sponsor up in Colby, next Sunday, they are doing a, a church cleanup for the church that's been allowing them to use their facility, which is College View. So if you're available to go up and help uh, next Sunday and do some physical labor, uh, going to be leaving here at, I'm not, I've, I've got to preach. But uh, hey, we're going to be gathering here at 10 and heading up to Colby to take the church van and uh, would love for you to come. It's uh, get there around noon, eat a meal with them, and then you'll be heading back around five. It's about a two hour drive, so you'll be back by seven. But if you're looking for like a local kind of missions, uh, regional missions trip to go help for a day, just do some cleaning, uh, they would be greatly blessed by that. So if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer that. So, okay, thank you.
All right, if you would please stand as we sing our closing song. Yeah.